Right. Okay. Um, it's now 11 o'clock, so I think we can begin. Uh, do you, Patti? Yeah, yeah, great. Sure. Sure. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us for this live conversation, and in particular, uh, Guyapati, uh, who is joining us from the ULEC Center uh, in Spain, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually an outgrowth of the Ecodharma Center there. Anyway, very welcome. I've really been looking forward to this conversation, and I'm, I'm delighted that we're able to have it. Yeah, me too, David. Thanks for the Thanks for the suggestion of um, having having this chat. Yeah, I'm pleased to. So, uh, as a way of beginning, uh, would you like to tell us something about the Eco Dharma Center, uh, what you're engaged in now, and then maybe we can go backwards afterwards and get a little bit of the history of of how it came to be. Yeah, sure. So, so. And the Ikadama Center is, um, and well, the Ikadama project really here, we think of it as a, as a whole project, the center being part of that, uh, is a collective project in, in Catalonia, in the mountains, Pyrenees, uh, on the, the, the Spanish side of the border um, from France. And um, we have been, we've been operating now since, oh, well, as a, as a community, we've been around since about 2006. And then from about 2008 onwards, we started running activities, which were kind of trying to integrate uh, a, few, a few different sort of strands. So we were integrating uh, sort of a, you know, Dharma practice with uh, kind of ecological sensibility and uh, environmental education, uh, and also uh, social change work as well. So working with working with activists and this kind of thing, and we integrated those three strands into a program of retreats and trainings that we've been running since then. Uh, in the early days, a lot of work around sustainable activism. Um, then we started doing more work around kind of collaborative, how to collaborate well together. Uh, we ran things that looked a bit more like. Uh, a bit more like retreats, really, where we were, you know, definitely sort of supporting people with meditation practice and, and, and basic dharma type stuff as well. Always in the service of kind of environmental action or, or other types of, of activism. And um, so we had that retreat education center. Uh, but also we live as a community. We're, we're a collective. Uh, we, live, um, we live collectively, uh, sort of, a, you know, fairly collectivized economy. We work as quite a close team. Um, and we have a we have a broader team as well, you know, a network of people working with us um, who are not all based here, although most of us are based here. And all of that is kind of set in a context that we uh, want to sort of develop more and more as having a kind of a real kind of agroecology, regenerative, regenerative uh, agriculture dimension to it as well. Hmm. So, you know, that's, that's that's kind of what it is. You know, it's a collective project up here in the mountains, uh, very engaged in that kind of stuff. We're actually, this year, uh, the Ikadama Centre as such, is in what we're calling a fallow year. You know, we've been operating and working quite hard at that for maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we figured that, you know, it was a good time to kind of step back a little bit, have a slightly more kind of reflective space to decide, so what next? You know, think strategically about what next. And it's one of the things that we encourage a lot in our trainings, uh, action reflection. You know, balancing action and reflection. So, you know, we do that all the time, but every now and again, it's worth having big spaces for a lot more kind of open thinking, creative thinking about, you know, where will we go now? So we're in this fallow year now. Mm. Um, although that doesn't mean that we're, 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 we're not actually quite busy in other ways, because as you just mentioned, um, several years ago, out of the Ecodharma Center grew the uh, ULEX project. Mm. It's a more secularly, it's more, it's framed in a more secular way. It's still very much rooted in the Dharma, mm -hmm. uh, as the Eco Dharma project, uh, but it's, um, it's a project which provides training for activist, activist education to help to build capacity within social movements in Europe. And that, that project has really taken off. So, you know, that actually keeps, although we're in a fellow year within the Eco Dharma Center as such, a lot of the teams are actually very busy with this other work as well. But yeah, so that's, that's what we're about, collective projects up here in the mountains. 
Well, there's two interesting issues there to follow up on. Uh, number one, uh, how the fallow year is going in the sense that what you've been thinking about so far, where, where you might want to take Ecodharma and that your particular center. And of course, the other one is if, if you can tell us a bit more about the ULEX Center, do you say ULEX or ULEX? Uh, I say ULEX, ULEX, but okay. I mean, you know, it's actually a Latin word, and I, I'm my Latin, I, I never learned Latin, so I don't know what the correct one is. It's, it's, I did learn some Latin, but I uh, don't remember that word, so anyway, yeah. well, it's, now, now I know. It, 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 I can tell you what it means. I mean, U, ULEX is uh, the Latin name for uh, what, in, in English, we, we tend to call it gorse. And Catalan call it agilaga. You know, it's a very spiky plant. Right, right. Yellow flowers gives off a, a, an odor a bit like um, a bit like coconut. You know, on a very sunny day. And uh, we chose the name because it's a, it's a plant that grows really well in very depleted soil. Um, it's a plant that is mm, really valuable in the regeneration, so natural regeneration of land that's been overgrazed or overworked by agriculture, this kind of thing, right? Uh, it has this, you know, has its ability to, to extract nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, and then fix it back in the soil, creates lots of great habitats, um, allows space for kind of natural reforestation to begin right. to occur as well. It's, you know, it's hard to graze down. So we chose it because with the ULEX project, what we kind of see ourselves as doing is helping to um, provide nourishment, sort of regenerate um, some of the, the sort of social, the basis for our social movements in Europe after a sort of a period of extractive, depletive um, sort of history in the, the last few decades of neoliberalism. So you know, mm -hmm. we, it's analogous in a way, you know, the plant, the way it helps to regenerate the soil, the land. I like that, yeah. We, through our trainings, trying to help to regenerate social movements in certain ways. So, yeah. so could you back up a little bit and just tell us about yourself, your own journey, and how that led to the development of the original Ecodharma Center? And by the way, I should mention, as far as I know, you're the one who first coined the term, at least I first heard it from you, Ecodharma. Is that correct? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I th in, in a Buddhist context, I think that probably is true. Uh -huh. At least when we when we began to use the term, we hadn't come across it before. You know, we felt it was a sort of neologism, neolog, neologism, or whatever the word is, like a new word that we were kind of coining at the time. But I think if you do some kind of Google search on like the history of the term, you can find precedent uh, mm -hmm. in some Indian uh, universities where they were talking about eco dharma from the, the the Hindu idea of dharma. Well. Right. There were some. There were some people maybe writing a an MA paper or something like that who were beginning to sort of play around with the idea as well. But anyway, in a Buddhist context, I think yeah. that's probably true. I like the fact that it's not just a Buddhist term. You know, it includes. I mean, obviously, the word Dharma is very important in a number of Indian traditions, and and I think what that points to for me is the sort of ecumenical or interreligious dimension of it. I'm sure that for both of us, we're not simply interested. In, in the Buddhist take, but that the but the fact that there's lots of overlap and there's lots to learn from other spiritual and non spiritual traditions as well. Yeah, I mean certainly. I mean when we I think when we talk about Dharma here, we we obviously owe an awful lot to the Buddhist tradition, um, but we're more interested in Dharma than Buddhism as such. Right. Uh, dharma being kind of you know the I suppose Dharma being you know, the path towards wisdom and compassion. And uh, Buddhism, as such, doesn't have a monopoly on that path. Right? Exactly. Yeah. But that's, that's one of the ways the Dharma has developed and is still developing. Yeah. I mean, I think it's exciting that uh, the Buddhist emphasis on impermanence and uh, insubstantiality really opens up the, to the fact that Buddhism has this potential to self-transform, to better yeah. meet the challenges of the present day, which certainly include ecological ones. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, back, back to, back to your... Uh, just looking at the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist tradition is one of remaking itself over and over again, right? It kind of reinvents yeah. itself in new historical conditions, different cultural conditions as well. And so Buddhism, when you look at it, although we think, you know, there's this one term for it, it's incredibly heterogeneous, right? It's so diverse. You know, the kind of the, the florid kind of bar Baroque kind of 
um, sort of forms of Tibetan Buddhism compared with the more sort of austere kind of, you know, aspects of some parts of Zen and so on. It's like, you know, it's an incredibly diverse tradition. And I think that what, what, what we're trying to do with Eco Dharma is a continuation of that, you could say, the tradition of Buddhist, the evolution of Buddhism. Yeah, it's oh. ongoing transformation under different historical conditions. That's how Buddhism has stayed alive and relevant to all of these centuries. Anyway, back back to your path. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and how that led to the founding of the Eco Dharma Center? <laughs> well, it's a long story. Dave. Well, <laughs> but I'll give you I'll give you what I kind of think of as like you know the highlights, and uh, I'll miss out all the all the bits that other people will probably tell you, right? So, um, I mean, I, I, I think of it very much as going back to my youth. I kind of see the roots definitely in my family, you know, as I guess many of us, us, us do. Um, my my mum grew up in a mining village, a coal mining village in, in Scotland. My dad grew up on the edge of Glasgow in the working class community. And at that time, you know, the labour movements were very, very strong. You know, this is sort of pre-neoliberal kind of period, obviously. Labour movements were very strong. And that created a real ethos in our household you know it kind of there was any an, an ethos that was very so, very socialist very strong scottish socialist kind of like mm -hmm. ethos in our household. that had a big effect on me a little bit later i mean in my early teens when i was about 14 i was definitely um, sort of indoctrinated into revolutionary marxism by uh, a bunch of people living in the town where i lived at the time which was fantastic you know really good political education mm -hmm kind of evolved out of that, sort of met kind of the anarchist traditions in my kind of late teens, um, at the same time as I came across Buddhism. And I, I met the Dharma uh, when I was about 19 years old. I was very fortunate to, to meet some really great people who introduced me to meditation and retreats. And so sort of the, the political and uh, the Dharma kind of have, you know, started to, together really at a very formative part at that time in my life. And then kind of through the through the 80s, became more and more exposed, largely through kind of anarchist interests to uh, ecological themes. Mm. Um, got very inspired by deep ecology um, and then even more inspired by uh, Murray Bookchin's kind of critique of deep ecology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, those, ecology. Yeah. and social ecology, yeah. Social ecology, quite, yeah. And those, those, those traditions, you know, the, and the, the, the sense, you know, my sort of activist background at that time, all led me to be wanting to kind of look at how uh, I could be more effective in the world and also find a way to embody the kind of values that those traditions were expressing. And I was in London then until, well, you know, up into my early 30s, uh, exploring these different, these different approaches, studying and bits of activism and so on. And I reached the point where I really wanted to kind of explore the opportunities to establish kind of an intentional community grounded in kind of ecological principles and the idea and also somewhere that could enable me to better give expression to my desire for a more contemplative life as well. You know, so, mm -hmm. so there's, there's kind of there's this sort of wonderful tension between these things like the Buddhism and the, and the activism the kind of contemplative kind of reclusive life up on a mountain and this kind of desire to really be kind of effective and, 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 and of, of some kind of service in the world. And that whole kind of process brought me to, to the mountains in Catalonia, to a place where um, the land was uh, relatively abandoned. Uh, it's an area that was very, very depopulated, you know, fairly economically depressed. Somewhere that in Europe and in, in certain in European terms, it was affordable to actually find uh, land and came across a, a, a set of ruins uh, with very little money in my pocket, actually, and um, met an old shepherd who kind of told me who owned the buildings and I went and chatted with them. And I was incredibly fortunate that they, they were an old couple who didn't have any children. Um, so they felt that it was possible to, to sell this land without there being any compromises in the family. And uh, they told me how much they wanted. It wasn't very much money, but I had even less. And they said to me, well, you're young, go away and do some work and come back and it'll still be here. So <laughs> did, a, did a few months work, came back, 
gave them a down payment. So that all started in about 2000, yeah, in about 2000. Yeah. And there was very much, you know, I, I came here on my own at that time, um, but always had it in mind that this would be a, a, a collective uh, project, a, a project that was rooted in, in a kind of an intentional community. And um, yeah, and so, you know, spent a bit of time initially on my own. I kind of, I think I was probably a bit burnt out looking back. I hadn't used those kind of terms at the time, but I suspect I was a bit burnt out from my, all, all the work I was doing in London. So I spent a couple of years without really moving things forward, wanting to take that more contemplative quiet time and also wanting to feel into whether this was something that I really wanted to do or not. You know, I was 35 at that time, so it's like 20 years ago. Yeah. I was 35 and I'd done a bunch of things up until then. And a lot of them had gone quite well. Mm. But usually I was finding that after about, you know, three to five years, I find myself sort of feeling, oh, this isn't quite it, you know. Mm. Time to try something it. else. Huh? Yeah, mm. it's not quite right. You know, there's sort of certain responsibility I didn't want or... Mm. And I didn't want to repeat that, you know, I didn't want to start here and five years later find, oh, that wasn't very well conceived or I, I didn't realise what I'd let myself in for. <laughs> and no collaborative project yeah. in the community, it was like, wow, there's going to be a lot of challenges, right? It's not going to be an easy thing to do. So I took a few years to really feel into that before I started reaching out to other people because I really didn't want to bring um, support other people coming into the project until I felt that I had really grounded my commitment to it and then began to reach out to people and you know since then I mean so many wonderful people have been involved and you know it really is it really is the kind of the fruit of the work of so many different people you know so many people so yeah yeah that's but that's the that's kind of the start of it really yeah. I should probably mention a couple personal connections here. First of all, the the invitation that I had from you, and I'm trying to remember how many years ago that was. You you heard me give a talk in Barcelona, and then yeah. invited me to visit. And you and I actually led a uh, a I think it was a long weekend uh, workshop up at the center, and I had an opportunity to see the the really amazing place that that you've built there. And and I have to say I was very inspired by that. And that certainly played a role in the establishment of the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Retreat Center that we've created here in Colorado in the mountains above Boulder. Mm -hmm. Although our situation is very different. I mean, you have a good part of a big, beautiful valley. Uh, we have a beautiful area as well, but it's only like 180 acres. And in fact, given the constraints on the land, we don't really have a residential community. Uh, at this point, it's I mean, we do have one or two people who are like resident managers during the season, but otherwise it's a place that we are uh, sort of making available for rent uh, by many other groups. And, and initially our attitude was, was sort of m making it available to m many teachers and they didn't necessarily have to have a very tight connection with ecodharma but we're slowly in our own way working out what ecodharma means for us and our center and maybe that is a, um, a a a kind of transition into i think the next question which is i mean how do you understand ecodharma today uh i'm sure it's evolved over the years uh, and where do you see it going? I mean, I think there, there's a lot of important uh, issues here to, to reflect on together. I mean, ecodharma as a concept rather than as, just, uh, as the center here, right? Um, mm. I think you're getting that. So, well, I mean, for me, one of the, one of the, one of the ways that ecodharma is often interpreted is that it's kind of like ecology, ecology in Buddhism and mm. that it uh, is, is really about, you know, environment, environmental green stuff and Buddhism kind of coming together. But actually for me, eco never meant that exclusively. You know, I, I, we, we were kind of taking the idea of ecology as a kind of a shorthand for the emphasis on uh, connection, relatedness, relationship of all sorts, mm -hmm. right? you know, kind of mm -hmm. ecology as, um, as it relates, say, to sort of, uh, you know, systems thinking, for example, you know, and the importance of uh, recognizing the, the interrelatedness of, of so many different things. 
And for us, that was very much the kind of the interrelatedness, the interrelatedness of, this is grounding it back in the Dharma, both the transformation of ourselves, but also the transformation of the world. And that, of course, has ecological implications. And the way we transform the world will have, you know, has to be sort of carried out in a way that has an ecological uh, integrity and uh, reaches towards a kind of ecological consciousness. But that's a consciousness that also recognizes ourselves not only as ecological, but also as fundamentally social. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's this, there's a, there's a little phrase, I think, from, I think it's John Gray, says something like, you know, humans, human beings aren't, aren't sort of, you know, natural artifacts. They're, they're exfoliations of the common life. You know, this, this sort of, this sense of the really being prepared to own the deep social nature of what and who we are. And so for us, in that sense, kind of eco also implies kind of social, it implies recognizing our social nature and recognizing that in our sort of actions to be beneficial in the world, that, imp- that implies kind of social engagement, social transformation, uh, political commitments as well. Yeah, so eco, eco is kind of, you know, wrapped up in all of that really for us. And, you know, and I think where that's, where that's, um, well, where, where is that going? Actually, we're seeing that more and more, right? You know, we're seeing more and more kind of discourses uh, across the world of sort of social change, recognizing that we need transversal responses. You know, we live in a world of interlocking systems of oppression and to address interlocking systems of oppression, we need interlocking, uh, connected, interrelated forms of resistance and building alternatives as well. You know, the, the recognition that, um, you know, I think I think you talk about this as well, right? That you know we can't think about climate change without also acknowledging the nature of the capitalist system, the nature of the capitalist system and climate change. You know, we can't really understand that problem without also understanding the issues of of racism, colonialism, and so on, right? This this is just becoming everyday stuff now, right? You know that we think more and more about, obvious, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so my sense is, it, where is eco dharma going? Well, it's kind of, you know, I think it's along with many other kind of influences, is um, is, is is on that kind of journey to try and understand so how does that mean we need to organise in order to support the kind of deep radical transformation that that our times really need, you know, both at a social and at a, at a right. Public. The other thing that I would add there, which I'm sure is implicit in what you were saying, is that when we're talking about climate crisis or the climate emergency, it's not just the climate ecologically, too. I mean, if we understand ecology in the very narrow sense, what's going on with the climate is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of all of the other incredible things that are happening in terms of biodiversity, the Mm. fact that so many plant and animal species are disappearing. We're into a six extinction event and, and you know uh what lo- loss of topsoil uh deforestation uh so many uh chemicals in the air in the earth in the water in our bodies uh, plastics everywhere and we you know we can go on and on but the idea that when we talk about climate uh we need to remember the the interlocking nature of that as well. In, in other words, I'm, I'm not disagreeing at all with what you said, the importance of the social, but they all go together. And, yeah. and we could see those, I think, as, as, as you pointed out, uh, very much connected with the kind of uh, economic and political system that we have today. In fact, when, when you put it all together, what I really get, it's the sense of a civilization that's lost its way. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why, it's not just Buddhism, but Dharma in the broadest sense that we need to rethink just the whole meaning and goal of of sort of contemporary modern or postmodern civilization. And that also involves personal transformation as well. So Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be finished with this in five years, Guyapati. I mean, you know, there's more than enough here to keep us all busy for a very long time to come and yeah. uh, exploring those connections and also finding ways to address them is, is, is going to be absolutely essential. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the other thing, if I can just mention, and I don't know if this is your experience as well, within, say, American Dharma, American Buddhism, 
Uh, as you know, the three treasures of Buddhism are Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You know, we have a lot of teachers, we have a lot of teachings, but in many ways, I think where we're falling short is in the development of Sanghas. Mm -hmm. um, and well, even in the Zen world, for example, so often you come together, you meditate quietly for a week, you hear a Dharma talk by the Zen master, maybe you have a one and one, but except for a little chit chat over tea at the end, you may not really be building any real community. And, and it seems to me part of the challenge for eco Dharma is that we're going to have to be a lot more proactive in terms of creating communities, because the only way we're going to be able to address uh, collective institutional problems of the sort that you mentioned as well is mm -hmm. by coming together and finding ways to work together. That I think points to another of the great scams, uh, the, the great eco scams. Somehow it's all about me reduce, reducing my individual carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. if we all did that, then everything would be okay. And, and I think one of the implications of what we're talking about is finding ways to to work together to address and there's where i'm really impressed by the fact that you're and and inspired and and regretful that we actually can't have our community up there at the eco dharma center given the constraints but as i remember you have a wonderful evolving community uh up at your eco dharma center so i think the the community the fact that some of us live together closely is a very very important part of that i mean it, it's a it's a, it's a way of really building deep trust of kind of creating spaces where we can really support each other but also grow through the kind of challenges that arise when we live together you know the kind of the quality of feedback that we get from each other and so on and um but but i but i think Mm, you know, community is a, is, is, is a term with so many different connotations, right? Mm. And I think you can build a community without necessarily living and sharing spaces together as well. And my sense is that the kind of, the way that you're portraying the lack of Sangha, I think, in, the, in, in American Buddhism, right, or, or the weakness of that at least, right, um, I think is, uh, is just symptomatic, right, of the, the broader social recession. You know, Robert Putnam, Bowling Alone, all this kind of stuff that individualism, you know, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the big influence of, you know, to some extent, consumerism, pre neoliberalism as well. But mm -hmm. neoliberalism sort of hypercharged this kind of process, atomization, individualistic kind of lifestyles and strategies. And so, that same loss of community, it's not just in, in Buddhism, but we've got that kind of, you know, across the board, right. So, so I think what we do need is, is a form of Buddhism that re-emphasizes Sangha, uh, importantly. Um, but this is something we need to move, ju not just for Buddhism, but it's something that needs to be applied to the whole of society. So as Sangha, I don't think it's quite enough. I think we need to sort of reconceptualize that in terms of like, um, we, 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 talk, we talk about the idea of um, collaboration um, with a, on, on the basis of a commitment to going for the good of the whole, right? And collaboration, you know, just coming together with an intention that's bigger than just the group itself, you know, this kind of aspiration to go for the good of the whole, to kind of act in solidarity with life. I think we can do that without having to live together necessarily, right? You know, create just this making these commitments to each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, re it's really important that we create spaces to do that. I think it's important because I think if we as individuals want to grow, we need those contexts of like really close, uh, I'm going to use the word intimate, but I'm not talking about sexuality or I mean, I'm talking about, you know, coming together in ways that build, you know, deep trust, real friendship, um, based, based on values, you know, kind of Kalyana Mitrata, spiritual friendship. Um, you know, we, we need to find way, we just need to find ways to kind of promote that more and more because it will help, you know, it helps us to create spaces that we can grow in, but also is necessary for us to be effective in the world. Hmm. You know, there's so little that we can achieve sort of in, in individually. Um, we really need to build collective agency, collective power at this time. So, yeah, that's, that's a really, really important emphasis, I think. But, but, you know, whether it's as Sangha in a, in a kind of explicit sense, okay. or whether it's as a kind of a, a reformulating, um, we're sort of trying to capture some of the heart of what Sangha is about in more secular ways, I don't think that matters so much in a sense. So, yeah. 
you know, when you look at the history of Buddhism, uh, Sangha has many different dimensions. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, if you go back to the earliest teachings, the Pali Canon, it was quite clear that for the original Buddha, it was fourfold. It was not only monastics, men and women, but it was also lay men and lay women. And, uh, and yet the way it evolved over time is that the, the, the lay tended to drop out and the real Sangha was the monastics and the job of the other people was to, was to support them. I mean, it's interesting, you know, now that Buddhism has come to the West or to the modern world, I mean, obviously, we still have monastics, but they don't seem to be serving that major role that they were originally. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the reasons that Buddhism became so successful, in, at least in the United States, was that it did plug into that basic kind of individualism that was already here, right? It's like yeah. uh, in the Zen world, uh, I'm here to work for my own awakening. Right, mm -hmm. my my own enlightenment, and d mm -hmm. despite the emphasis in the classical teachings about the bodhisattva path, that wasn't necessarily the thing that that came out certainly at the beginnings or in the early days of the development of of, yeah. of American of American Zen. But but getting back to this question of sangha, um, I mean, one of the important things about Buddhism, I think, mm -hmm. and and Indian religions in general was this sense of responsibility to all sentient beings or all living beings, unlike the Abrahamic traditions where there's so much just focus on humans, mm -hmm. our tribe and their tribe. There was much, you know, as we know in the Bodhisattva tradition, we, we take a vow to help all sentient beings wake up. And I guess in that sense, we could say that's the ultimate Sangha or, or even referring to the earth as a whole, that mm -hmm. somehow what we're waking up to uh, given the situation we're in now, what we're waking up to is the importance of that as the Sangha, not just the mother, and we never cut the umbilical cord, but as the Sangha and that at, at the heart of whatever transformation is necessary, it's, it's going to have to be some kind of healing of our relationship with it, both individually and, and especially collectively in, in, in terms of... Uh, overcoming the kind of alienation, person, personal and institutional, that is so much a hallmark of the kind of civilization that we have today. Yeah, the, I mean, it reminds me of Gary Snyder's sort of phrase of the great earth sangha, I think is a, a little essay that he wrote right at one point. I remember that. But yeah, I think there's, I think there are kind of like these, these different levels of kind of sort of reconnection. Uh, you know, I think it gets articulated by like quite a lot of people in different ways today, but that sense that's so important to, you know, the Dharma can support us very much in the kind of the reconnection with ourselves, developing our emotional literacy, um, developing, you know, self, self awareness, kind of greater psychological integration, this kind of stuff, right? Um, and we also then need to kind of think about and how do we connect more with each other, you know, atomization, alienation, individualism. It's like how do we kind of move beyond that as well through our creation of new sort of social formations where we can build trust, build understanding, um, build kind of collective enterprises in a way, right? And yet, of course, we need to go beyond those two as well to that sense of a, a, the, the bigger connection to, well, our, our sort of more a sort of fundamental sort of ecological identity, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's very, very important. All three so, so, so I mean, we can talk about three levels of healing, I suppose, is what I'm picking up from what you're saying. You know, there's the the individual healing, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. the social healing, and there's the ecological healing. Mm -hmm. And the reality, of course, is that they're all interconnected and whatever healing happens on one level is is going to help uh, the healing that's necessary on the other levels as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's the greater challenge. I, th I think that's true to 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 some extent. I don't think it's inevitable. I mean, I think it's you know we used to run a lot of tra a lot of trainings here that were very much about kind of what we call sort of nature based practice. You know, we would sort of spend a lot of time out in the out in the out in the mountains, out in the woods with people, um, you know, learn sort of basic stuff, all the stuff that that kind of classically helps people to kind of reweave their connection with the non human world. You're tracking kind of learning about the trees and the plants and sort of foraging and 
and sleeping under the stars, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, my sense of that was that it's very easy for that to turn into another kind of like, almost a sort of consumerist kind of attitude, you know, you're going out there for, your, for an experience of some sort. Huh. And started to have this sense of people being, becoming quite preoccupied with like their connection with nature, you know, my connection with nature. Ah, interesting. As though in a sense, you know, your connection with nature kind of matters to the, the non-human world, right? What might matter, right, is whether you're able to transform the sense of connection into the kind of collective action that's necessary to actually defend and support that, right? So, you know, I, I, it's like it has to translate into real solidarity as well. And, and that, so there's something for me that unless we're, unless that kind of personal healing, unless the, even our community healing, or our kind of ecological healing, unless they translate into solidarity, which implies for me a kind of committed action, I think it's very easy for that to kind of fall back into a kind of quite self-referential, quite self-preoccupied kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. We've we've tried to address that sometimes, like these are some of the programs that we do. Uh, Johan Robbins and I, for example, uh, offer a couple what we call eco dharma retreats and we start out spending as much time as possible in the natural world because many people are you know starved for that and 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 there's a lot of emphasis on gratitude practice but then on the basis of a day or two of that then we go into uh because at that point people have been living and practicing together like 24 7 for a few days then we move into finding ways to address our grief about what's happening because what we're finding is that and maybe it's especially the kind of people who come to our retreats but there there's there's an enormous amount of grief but often it's repressed because mm -hmm. people are afraid it's so strong or or they don't know what to do with it or they really feel despair in the sense of uh, what difference can I make or is, is it too late and and so what what we then do is we we do have some time together when we uh, share and, and we have different ways of sort of prompting that but, but helping people start to share what they're feeling about what's actually going on in, in a group setting and and we have found that very very powerful because my experience and my sense is that uh, what's what's keeping people what's keeping many people from the activism and the solidarity is is the sense of of despair and and there's some sense of disempowerment like why should I bother what should I do and so so we we work on this together and, and we share and then interestingly people, Pretty soon thereafter, they go out on the land by themselves for a night or two. They do what we call solos. And then um, and then one of the things we encourage is not to sort of program or schedule the solo too much, but sort of open up to sort of what the land, what wherever you are, you're by yourself somewhere under a tree or whatever, uh, to ask um, to be open to what the land has to offer you, but also as far as the way forward. And then when we come back together, we 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 share debrief, if if you want to use that word, uh, what what was going on in the soul, what's been going on inside us, and and I guess what what we find is that there's something incredibly not only liberating but empowering about it that that people have this real. Uh, not only the desire, but they they feel that they can actually become more engaged. It's a little tricky because people attending those retreats have come from many different sorts of places, and so they'll go back there. They won't necessarily be, you know, being together, working together. But our sense is very much that they do feel there's an opportunity there. Yeah, now, is I mean, that similar to something you guys have been going through? Or that really that all resonates with me, right? You know, so so sim similar kind of activities that we've run here over the years as well. Okay. Um, I do a lot more of that than I do now. You know, fortunately there are other people who've been able to pick that up so within within our within our kind of networks and so on. Um, and 
a couple of people now, um, May McKeith and, and, and um, Cara Moses, who are, who are now developing something we're calling radical nature connection, which is kind of really ensuring that we kind of roll into that stuff, the kind of, you know, political perspectives, understanding of uh, decolonialism, for example, uh, looking at things like, you know, cultural appropriation that can often get sort of woven into some of that kind of work as well. Mm -hmm. And so, so I'm doing less and less of that, but, but it all resonates with me. However, right, one of the things that I have noticed and, and you know, the, the grief work, you know, I was involved in work that reconnects type work many years ago as well. Mm. Um, and we still weave some of that into, into, into some of our work now. But what we kind of often found was like people would, would kind of, you know, there was often kind of catharsis, the sense of revitalization, the sense of a deeper connection with themselves, a sense of initial motivation. But unless they had the channels for that, mm -hmm. that, that refound energy, right? That right. refound sort of emotional connection, that refound vitality, um, that, you know, it, where would it go, right? You know, the, the potency isn't just about us feeling potent, it's also mm -hmm. about having really concrete and specific places and ways in which we can give expression to that which mm -hmm. means doing it with others mm -hmm. it means organizing right in my mind right it mm -hmm. means kind of actually you know taking the time to build the relationships build the projects build the mission and the visions together that people can then feel that they're able to really uh, actuate you know that that kind of motivation with some of the work that we connect stuff and um, that i noticed was that often what happened people would have a kind of catharsis and actually they'd come back for another catharsis and another catharsis because it was that feeling of like, you know, that, that release was, was kind of really important to them. But unless they could find a channel for it, it just felt like it could become a bit of a repetitive cycle that, yeah, it felt better, but, but you know. So, so I think this, the, as well as that kind of work, I think mm -hmm. we also need to be putting emphasis on how do we organise the spaces and the channels that give expression to that newfound vitality. How do we find the spaces that allow, right. that can almost also, also almost allow us to kind of have those feelings and then live with those feelings in an ongoing way, you know, to, to con and we can only afford to continue living with them if we also feel that we're sort of effectively able to effectively engage with the, 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 the challenges, the structural dilemmas and problems that that are kind of, you know, leaving us to feel disempowered, overwhelmed, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, organizing, I think, is really important component to those things. So, so can you tell us a bit more about how you've promoted that? Because, as I know, uh, with the workshop that I was at, and also, I believe, with the Udlex project, it's like people come from all places, mm. um, mostly Europe, different parts of Europe, and they would be together for a certain period of time, and then they would be going back home. How, how, can you tell us a bit more about how you actually promote that? And my sense is, of course, that the ULEX project is very much a part of that. Yeah, so, so I think there are two things that we've done to kind of address that kind of more strategically. One, one is simply the, the kind of the, the shift in terms of who we choose to work with. Right. Um, okay. We work. We work. We, we scarcely work these days with people who are looking for a way to do something. Right. Who are kind of like something needs to happen. What might it be? Right. Mm -hmm. Is that because you know we have we have limited resources. We can run. You know we we work we work with. I mean these days mm, maybe four hundred plus activists every year, but it's still a drop in the ocean. Right. Um, and these are activists, people who are already already activists to some well, degree. Because yeah. we can only work with that number of people. It's like, so how do we, how do we, mm. what criteria do we use for who we work with? So we we tend to only work with people who already have a proven track record that they're going to be doing stuff, right? They're actually, mm -hmm. they're going to be, and not alone, but working with others. So they're in networks, in organizations, in groups, they have political, social, ecological projects that, that, mm -hmm. that they're committed to doing. Because we feel that they're the people who will create the opportunities for these other people who are saying, what can I do? These people will create the infrastructure, the situations that others can kind of then join into. So we want to strengthen that. So that's one thing, the kind of criteria we use for who, who we decide to actually engage with. The other thing that we've done is we now we work 
um, largely with organizations rather than individuals. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the, the way that the way that we develop our program now is we every year we do what we call a kind of context analysis. You know, we look at what the political, social, ecological, legal kind of situation right, at, at European level. Um, from that, we set priorities. So, you know, is it is it kind of uh, is it the, the the rise of the far right? Is it the um, the particular kind of autocratic governance in in eastern parts of Central and Eastern Europe? Is it is it climate? You know, the climate crisis. What are the priorities we're working on this year? And from that, we then decide. Okay, so if this is the, if this is the area, we, we, the, the couple of priority areas. Who are the people who we can best support to kind of you know build their capacity there? And then we reach out to through our networks organisations. And with those organisations, do needs assessments. What do they need? You know, what um, what would support them to to be more effective in their work? And you know that's within the framework of the kind of things that we offer. You know if they tell us well actually what we need is like better training in um, uh, bookkeeping or something. It's like well you know there's some great bookkeeping schools probably down the road, right? So mm -hmm. it's in, in in the sort of context what we do. But we do these needs assessments and then we develop our program to sort of be responsive to that. And that can be, you know, be, um, it's quite a wide range, you know, the program has, I mean, there's a lot of regenerative activism stuff, so sustainable activism type work, right, um, which is, you know, something very core uh, to, to, to the stuff that we've learned, and includes nature connection and this kind of stuff as well, the regenerative activism work. There's a lot of stuff on what we call transformative collaboration. How we work better together? How can we? How can we really sort of build creative synergies, uh, build strong teams? This kind of stuff. We do a lot of work on strategic thinking as well. You know, it's like I mean, my my view is that a bodhisattva today, right, would would think like, if I'm going to be effective, I have to be strategic, right? So so in our social movements and organisations, how can we be more strategic? How can we use the resources we have to build power, to build capacity as we go? To become more and more effective, right? So we do a lot of work on strategy, a lot of work on kind of movement, movement scale strategy, mm -hmm. how to think about the relationships across movements, across the diversity within our, within our movement. We even do work on um, this kind of idea of holistic security. You know, it's like as, as organizations become more effective in some contexts, they tend to get more of a pushback. So, you know, organizations we work with in, in Hungary, for example, mm. and in, part, in Poland and, and in, in other places where there's, there's, there's quite a lot of state repression kind of building up. We help them to kind of look at holistic security. So digital, physical and psychosocial kind of security and well-being. And some of it's kind of quite hard nosed kind of technical stuff, but it's always in this holistic kind of framework and that yeah, you know, that we also need to take care of ourselves and we need to build cultures of care within our organisations. We need to find ways to really embody the values that we want to bring forth in the world in the way that we struggle together, in the way that we organise together. So it's quite, you know, and I mean, that's just part of the programme. It's quite mm. a good programme. But the way we do it is that we're, we're, quite, we're quite fussy in our criteria who we choose to work with. Mm. And we tend to work more and more with organisations and kind of accompany them on the kind of a year, year and a half, um, sometimes even longer kind of period of organizational capacity building. And some of them are like more NGO types, you know, some of them are very, very grassroots groups um, from a, a wide range of like you know, social movement. So yeah, so that's yeah. Cool. well, I mean, I, I'm really impressed you're, you're definitely in a different league than we are in terms of what you're doing. And obviously it's showing the fruit too of the many years that you've been operating and what you've been learning along the way. Um, it, it also raises differences too in funding. I mean, I think the reason you can be funding is that you have uh, funding sources that I think enable you to do that, right? I think you get EU grants and similar things, yeah? I mean, we, we were very, very, I mean, as, as, as the Ecodama Centre, we've always been very fortunate in having sort of, good, you know, people being very generous and supporting us with donations and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the trainings, the retreats that we ran, 
we always ran on the, on the side of a gift economy. You know, we didn't charge for anything. We still don't charge for anything. We, we now call it solidarity economy. Um, so, and so, you know, people would, when they could give us, you know, what they could and so on, we could sort of survive on that. But yeah, since we, with the ULEX project, because it, it has a secular framework, it does open up access to a lot of funding that's not available otherwise. And right. I think that's really important. You know, if we're going to, if we're going to have, if we're going to have the kind of impact that's being called for today, um, we mustn't be shy of thinking in a hard nosed way about how we're generally going to resource that. You know, it's like, you know, we work with activist burnout and an awful lot of it, we talk about, um, you know, again, emotional literacy and, you know, self-awareness and understanding the deeper, the deeper drives that, that, that lead to, you know, dysfunctions in, in, a, in, a, in our activism, for example, right? Um, but of course, there are other kind of really basic material factors like not having enough money, not having enough resources, too many people trying to do too much work, too, too few people trying to do too much work. So again, we're trying to be we're trying to be, yeah, smart about that, right? You know, so so the ULEX project being secular means that yes, we can access a, a lot of other funding, and we've put an awful lot of energy into that, um, so that we can help to resource other people, so that we can, you know, as, as well because we we pull in this funding, we can give our work, you know, freely to 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 others, really. Yeah. Yeah. Could could you give us a bit of a preview of where the fallow year thinking might be leading you? I mean, I know the ULEX project is still quite, quite new or relatively new in the sense that a lot of it is growing that and there's lots of potential there. Anything else that you'd like to share in terms of what you see yourself doing, where you're going to be developing in the next few years, where you'd like to go if, if the resources are there? Um, I mean, two two things that are, uh, are taking up a lot of my time at the moment. One is one is one is more ULEX oriented, and it's this this project we're calling uh, strengthening strengthening European social movement ecology. Right, so the ecology again comes up, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a big survey recently with with a few partners, and I think we were like more than a hundred organisations, like in about twenty countries or something. I can't remind you. Something like that, right? And uh, we are asking them, what are the real learning needs for social movements at the moment in Europe? And what came up again and again and again was the inability to work well across certain kinds of differences. So the inability to work uh, from across different issues, the inability to work with different kinds of kind of movement actors and so on. So this kind of, this real sense of the need to strengthen the capacity to build kind of transversal strategies and connections within social movements. And for me, I think Ecodharma has a lot to offer in that because mm -hmm. so much of the challenge there is, um, is about kind of working with difference. And a lot of what helps us to work with difference is being able to hold a bit more loosely to our views, right? Being able to recognize that our views and our positions, our strategies are partial and they're provisional. And Dharma training helps us to, to acknowledge that more and more fully, right? So we're more, we can become more comfortable with diversity in certain kinds of ways, right? So I think, you know, that kind of movement strategy, that building of bridges, building transversal capacity, I think is something we'll put a lot of energy into and with, with, with a sort of a, a real deep Dharma heart to it in a way, although we'll probably never mention the Dharma to 99% of the people we do that work in, in support. So that's one thing. And then another another thing that we're doing at the moment is putting a lot of energy into a much into a bigger uh, agroecology, uh, regenerative activism, uh, regenerative agriculture uh, project as well. Mm. So you know, there's where, where, where we live. There, 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 you know, there's a lot of field. There's a lot of woodland and and so on. And, you know, we've done okay, you know, we've got a little forest garden, we've got fruit trees, and we've got vegetable gardens and this kind of thing, right? Um, but we're a long way off being able to kind of say that it's a really viable kind of agricultural work. So much of our engine has kind of gone into the educational side, whether it's the, the, the explicitly kind of more Dharma stuff or, or the activist training. Um, and 
for one reason or another, the kind of land-based stuff has kind of lagged behind a little bit. But the Ecodharma vision, that's a really integral part of it. You know, mm -hmm. We want to be able to be living in this place uh, in a way that also kind of, you know, models uh, those kind of, you know, sustainable living systems, really. Not just within, on the land that we're on, the idea of this sort of regenerative agriculture project is also, uh, it's, it's looking at that at a kind of bioregional level. So, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, it will involve kind of surveying kind of, you know, different needs and different sort of economic opportunities and looking for ways of kind of exchanging and how what we can grow can complement what other kind of local growers doing, you know, it's working in a similar way can work. So that's very, very exciting. That's a really exciting thing. And we're, we're in a phase at the moment of, you know, doing sort of more, more detailed um, um, viability plans and understanding the, 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 the way the land is, you know, the way the water runs on the land uh, using kind of, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you or other people listening in are familiar with the idea of sort of key, key line uh, work where you kind of, you, you kind of have, a, you, you understand how you can help to sort of direct water in certain ways because water is a big issue here. Uh, a big yeah. issue here as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so so I, that, that's very, very exciting. I mean, that's really exciting, actually. You know, I would, I would so love to see that, that side of the project come thriving more fully. So we're doing more of the groundwork that will help and support other people to sort of be able to come in and, and get involved in that as well. Yeah. I, I think that the, the comparable movement here, and there are many elements to it, but uh, our permaculture would certainly be a, a big, big part of it. And that too is something that we're hoping to explore up at the Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Center. Uh, Although physically we're, we're quite constrained, we're up at 8,500 feet and it's a, a, a very a short growing season, but more than that, the kind of nature conservancy uh, limitations were actually not allowed to sort of set up gardens or farms. So yeah. in terms of that particular piece of land, we're limited, but as you say, the connections between mm -hmm. ecodharma in the broadest sense and those kinds of rediscovery and uh, development of, of more um, sustainable agricultural models. I think that's a really, really important part of it. It's, we're starting to work a little bit with a few people who are specializing in that area, but it's very early days for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the prospects here in that way. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the time, I'm just wondering, um, whether there are any other issues or things that you would like to reflect on? I mean, we've talked about quite a few, but uh, if there's something else on your mind that you'd like to share or raise, feel free. Mm. Mm. Also, in a bit, uh, I'm going to open things up. I, I'm not quite sure where we stand, but I think there's an opportunity for people to ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. That will be forwarded to me. So if that happens, if some appear in my chat box, I'll, I'll let you know. But in the meantime, uh, throw it back to you. Um, I think the, I mean, yeah, I mean, just circling back around to this kind of to this question of Sangha, I think uh, there's something there for me that it's so important. It's such an important emphasis. I mean, for me, I remember, I remember when I was um, uh, maybe I was like 20 seven years old or something like that you know i've been into, involved in the dharma for quite a few years and um i remember uh my really a, a mentor of mine at the time a man called kudamitra who was like a really really important spiritual friend to me hmm. uh, you know older than i was so my mentor and i remember him, him sort of you know going for a, a cup of tea in a park or something and and uh, he said to me uh he said how many you know how many how many jewels are there in, in, in Buddhism, you know, there's the three jewels. And he said, do you think the Buddha just kind of rounded it up? And it's like, oh, no, I doubt it very much. He says, so what is it with you then? You know, it's like, you can see you're really into the Dharma. You've got this real aspiration, you know, towards the ideal of the Buddha. But it's like, you know, you're kind of, involved, your commitment to Sangha, it's like, you know, it, it's actually quite weak. You know, I think I was operating in a fairly sort of individualistic kind of way as far as my practice went. 
And he said, you know, if the Buddha didn't surround it up, it's like, if you're going to go for refuge at all, effectively, you need to be going for refuge to all three jewels, right? So there's a question there for us, like, if we don't have Sangha, right? If we're not able, if we're not creating Sangha, are we going for refuge at all, right, at that point? And of course, you know, my Dharma practice at that time, it had an important, you know, transformative impact on me. But having begun to take that more seriously, I realized just how right he was, you know, that, you know, really looking at the, 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 the quality of our relationships, committed relationships with others, especially in terms of, you know, collaborative effort, I think is such an important ingredient for our, for our, 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 our spiritual lives. And I, I think there's something in this as well for the, you know, we, 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 we talk about the, you know, in Mahayana, of course, of course, there's this whole idea of the bodhicitta, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the arising of the, of the sort of, you know, the, the, the awakened mind, or I mean, so many different, different translations, right? It's an arising bodhicitta. And I love this idea that, that we came across years ago that, you know, the bodhicitta doesn't arise in an individual. You know, the bodhicitta arises between us. Right? Mm. So if you really want to make a kind of bodhisattva type commitment and aspiration to train in that way, right? To train in solidarity and ground, solidarity and groundlessness, wisdom and compassion, then we've got to take it really seriously to build those spaces where the bodhicitta can arise, right? Not in us, not in us individually, not appropriating that again to like, you know, some kind of self, sense of self aggrandment or something, but in that space between us. I sort of really love that idea, actually. Really love that idea. Mm -hmm. that, uh, in, I'm, uh, I'm... Our committed work in solidarity with life is the space, you know, together is the space where, where bodhicitta arises. I actually hadn't heard that about uh, bodhisattva cheating, uh, mm. <laughs> bodhicitta arriving uh, between us. Uh, mm. It actually reminds me of a famous line from the Bible where, you know, it's often translated, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. But mm. I've also seen scholars say, no, that's actually a little bit misleading. It's mm. better translated, the kingdom of God is among you. Yeah. Whoa, that's a totally different mm. point if that's mm. if that's the appropriate you know translation of the greek yeah mm. and i'm also reminded of the pali canon where the uh, i'm sure you know the famous story where ananda his attendant comes to the buddha and says you know i think a spiritual friendship is a really important part of the path mm. and the buddha says don't say it like that ananda don't say it like that it's the most important part of the path and mm. yet somehow that's what gets left out just because of the way that Buddhism come, at least speaking in this country, how much Buddhism has come to a kind of an accommodation with, uh, you called it neoliberalism, I'm more often saying corporate consumer capitalism. And of course that, especially the consumerism, it's very much an individual and how Buddhism has become just one more thing we consume as you as, as you well expressed it before. So if, if, if we just think of what ecodharma, the, the challenge of ecodharma in the broad sense, what that challenge is to Buddhism, mm -hmm. what does it mean? How does it challenge the Buddhist traditions to change? I think that that maybe is, is, is number one at the top of the list because it's too easy at this point to fit Buddhist practice into our usual, yeah. often middle-class individualism. And if we're going to address I'm just repeating what you said, but if if we're going to address all of these really critical challenges we face tonight, now we're not going to be able to do it individually. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it, but that is it's so hard, isn't it? Because it's like there's a yeah the kind of the slant of the table <laughs> in terms of the way that society is structured, in terms of the way that you know people are we're sort of rewarded in life and so on and so forth, right? It, it's like it's all slanted towards that kind of individualistic way of being. Right. We're so deeply conditioned by that. It's so important to, to acknowledge the extent to which we're conditioned by that. And so much that kind of seems every day and normal to us is merely a kind of, you know, it's a particular, it's the outcome of particular social structures. Um, so it's a lot of work, you know, it's an awful lot of work to kind of go against that. And a lot of learning as well, because mm -hmm. coming together with people even on the best kind of you know with the best intentions with like 
you know, the highest aspirations, the most kind of spiritually kind of inspired kind of, you know, motives, it's still bloody hard work, right? <laughs> well, know, it requires a lot of patience and a lot of skill and a lot of commitment to our, our individual and collective practice to kind of do that meaningfully. You had mentioned earlier how communities, you know, don't have to be living together, how, how you know, you, you can have extended ones, but it's also the case that, you know, living together helps. Hmm. Uh, often you, you're going to bond and it's a lot easier. And, and I think part of the issue is, of course, given the way social economic life is organized, yeah. right? Uh, my wife and I, we live in this house. Other people we know, not next door by any means, but several miles away, are living in their individual houses. And and again, that that fits in with the kind of social model that we've all sure. Sure. that I think we're all struggling with. Yeah, how does that fit in? Uh, mm -hmm. I do have we do have a question here, uh, which I'll read. And uh, let's see. I would like to hear if you aim to connect to people's transcendental or otherworldly experiences that people may have in all kinds of contexts, uh, Buddhist, atheist, Christian, agnostic, uh, who might inspire eco-action. Mm, interesting question, given that, you know, Buddhism and say Christianity have at times been very otherworldly focused. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, do you aim to do you aim to connect with that focus or what role do you see that focus playing? Question to me or to you? you, you, you uh, to both of us, I think, but I'm going to let you go first. Uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I know this is something that you, you've you spoken a lot about. I remember I kind of, um, I I ripped off the quote from, is it Loyal Rue that you you Loyal Rue? Yeah, you, you had this great, great quote from Loyal Rue. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I haven't actually read the book, Everybody's Story, I think it was called or something. That's right. You know, I saw that I, I came across a quote in one of your books, which was great. You know, the way that it that it kind of was was pointing to, you know, the way that the Axial Age traditions, right, to the extent that they um, perpetuate cosmological dualism and the idea of individual salvation. Exactly. Yep. To... Uh, disinterest or whatever in the integrity in social and ecological integrity. I think that's that's really well kind of put, right? And it's very, mm -hmm. very useful. Right? The idea that our practice is about uh, salvation somewhere else, right? In some in some higher kind of plane, uh, some other world, as that question sort of uh, suggests. Uh, or in some kind of reality that's behind this all this kind of illusion. <laughs> Not, not kind of real world that we're in, you know. It's incredibly unhelpful, I think. And, and Buddhism, of course, you know, is is um, is a tradition that at times has perpetuated that notion, or at least been interpreted as as perpetuating right. these kind of ideas, right? Um, that's all about interpretation, obviously, right? Um, but if, if obviously needn't be, you know, the, so the whole Mahayana, we're talking about the Bodhisattva, and why do we talk a lot about the Bodhisattva, the two of us? Because the Bodhisattva <coughs> is a practice, uh, it, it indicates a kind of practice that's an antidote to this kind of individualistic notion of salvation. And, you know, with Pranya Paramita, of course, you know, it philosoph philosophizes the non duality of Nirvana and Samsara, right? And that's, you know, so, so you, 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 you heal both of those kind of potential problems that, that Laura was pointing towards. And this is really important for Yukodama to put real emphasis on that. And I, I kind of love the, the kind of the whole thing of the Bodhisattva kind of vow, like, you know, not, you know, not, 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 not going into Nirvana until all beings are saved, right? Mm. So with also the caveat that all beings are innumerable and therefore they'll never all be saved. So you're never going to go into Nirvana. However, there's still this idea that there may be a nirvana to go to. So then you get this kind of later idea, don't you, of like non-abiding nirvana. The non-abiding nirvana being what the idea that it's not about escaping here from here to another world. It's about the way we engage with this one that so. really constitutes the nature of the liberation that Dharma is pointing to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with this question, transcendental otherworldly i mean i personally think that 
supramundane type experience, right? Such as dhyana and this kind of thing in, 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 in spiritual practice, in a spiritual life, are really important. You know, if it doesn't happen, no big deal. But where those things do arise, the nourishment, the clarity, the resourcing that comes from them, the inspiration that comes from those experiences is so important. You know, the experience of um, a mind that's, that's clearer, brighter, and more mm. agile, less proliferation. These things are inspiring, like and energizing, but they're still mundane. Right? They're, still, mm. old, they're still fundamentally mundane, super mundane, maybe the, the fullness, the honors and so They're really important. Yeah. But you know, but the but the Dharma says, yeah, and then bring that back out, you know, come back in, come back into here and kind of like how does that support you to oh, just get a hint of like, you know, how do you bring the you know the Buddha qualities, the kind of the 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 the, the manifest, the kind of the, the sort of bodhisattva aspiration in the everyday messiness of our, our day-to-day lives? You know, how do you yes, there's the lotus that opens. But it's so important to remember the nourishment comes from the kind of slimy, stinking sludge at the bottom of the at the bottom of the lake, right? You know, it's like without that rootedness, the lotus doesn't grow. And you know, I sort of love that kind of organic kind of notion of the, mm. the connection between these two. So, you know, that's so. Yeah, I, I think it's a really important question in terms of how we yeah. we frame and understand the Um Yeah, but without being able to inquire a bit more into the context of the question and, and a bit of clarification around it. Well, I mean, I, I would add to that, yeah. that um, I, I think, hmm, I think it was Joseph Campbell who said that a lot of the problems in religion occur because people take metaphors literally. Yeah. And uh, when I think about transcendence, I wonder if that's a really good example, because yeah. if, if we understand it metaphorically, what we could understand ourselves to be transcending is our usual dualistic way of experiencing the world. Mm. I mean, mm. I see the Buddhist teachings fit fitting into the realization that our normal way of experiencing the world and ourselves in the world is a psychological and social construct. And, uh, and given the dualism of that construct, there's certain types of dukkha suffering that are connected with it. But that through our practice, we can deconstruct and come to experience the world and ourselves in the world in a very different sort of way. So for me, that that is the more important part of, of the more important way of understanding um, transcendence. And, and it's interesting how, say, in, in, in the Buddhist world, you have some famous teachers like Banke talking about realizing the unborn. Mm. When you go back to the Pali Canon, the conventional way of understanding the ultimate goal is not to be reborn into this world, right? After you physically die, that's the way it's understood for the most part. And yet you have somebody like Banke saying, no, we need to experience the unborn. We can experience the unborn right here and right now. You know, you can elaborate on that, talking about emptiness or whatever. So again, it's not about, um, something that happens after we die but it's a transformed way of experiencing and living in the world it's like transformed experience that implies a different way of living a different way of relating to other people and to the earth so that i think is very important none of which for me necessarily denies that there are other dimensions i don't know what's going to happen after i die uh, and that in a way, I'm happy to let that take care of itself, but very much the idea of if you and I do the very best we can now, right here and now, that'll take care of itself. It's mm -hmm. like that that's the best way to prepare if there is some kind of afterlife survival, you know, and uh, and and so I, I think that kind of agnosticism or putting some of those claims on a shelf is, is the really important thing if we're going to avoid the problem that you and Loyal Rue talked about of becoming so preoccupied with transcending or escaping samsara that we don't engage with the kinds of challenges that we face today. Another question, if, uh, if I can go to that. Um, do you think that environmentalism in general is failing to elaborate an alternative social model to current capitalism? 
it seems that ecology is limited to certain isolated aspects of the production system without elaborating an alternative political economic system. Perhaps it's the fault of the left in general. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, it's interesting that, that there's a that the kind of the assumed association of left and environmentalism. I mean, there's lots of environmentalism that's incredibly conservative, in fact, quite right wing. Mm. And in parts of Europe, you could even say there are kind of, you know, that there are kind of uh, shades of like eco fascism kind of popping up in places as well, right? Um, so that's interesting. But that aside, <laughs> um, well, fault of the left. I mean, the left. I mean, the the, the you know, it's the the the, the, the sort of commonplace um, place to start now in thinking about the left is it's defeated, right? I mean, unless we acknowledge the historic defeat of the left, actually, it's very hard for us to imagine something else mm. you know, because the you know, but you know, there was the the, the whole neoliberal period which was a massive massive defeat. Finally, the kind of you know, the fall of the fall of the Berlin Wall, kind of like. You know, not that all of the left identified with kind of Soviet communism by any means, but I think at that point there was a sense that wow, that alternative has actually completely dissolved. Mm -hmm. I don't think the lack of a kind of a what what's the phrase um, an alternative social model um, is a problem of environmentalists or environmentalism. I think it's a, it's it's a much wider problem. Right? Mm -hmm. The uh, you know there's this. It was at Mark Fisher who sort of says, you know, that, um, uh, capitalism seamlessly occupies the horizon of the thinkable. Um, mm. and, and, you know, similar kind of thing. And you know, to that, you know, Jameson, I mean, I got bored of quoting this one, right? You know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine cap the end of capitalism, right? right? Now, this is something that we've got to kind of take on board that the hegemonic kind of dominance of, you know, the neoliberal system has made it almost impossible for many of us to imagine something else mm. and that's an enormous task right to kind of imagine a different kind of social relation different kinds of social relations um i think within that there's a deep spiritual problem which is also being prepared to reimagine ourselves you know it's like whether the hegemonic system works is you know of course it kind of builds kind of you know the the, the kind of the the structures of power, like the institutions, the kind of you know trade agreements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it also reconditions us, and one of the ways it's reconditioned us, I think, is it has really undermined our sense of confidence in what we can be. It's really undermined our sense of confidence in the positive human potential that's an integral part of us, and replaced that with this kind of sense of this internalized kind of acceptance of the idea that actually we're quite selfish beings. You know, actually, mm -hmm. Homo economicus is mm -hmm. kind of a fairly, you know, good kind of definition of us. Mm -hmm. Actually, we find it really hard to work together, and we do find it hard to work together, partly because of our socialization, right? Um, so I think it's so important, and this is where the Dharma comes in as well. Again, it really re-emphasizes that we can come together on the basis of honoring each other's potential for the good, you know. That, that, that you recognize my potential for good, I recognize your potential for good. And in that, we start to reaffirm that, that, that in a way that allows it to, 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 to flourish. It's only if we can also begin to recognize that potential that we have, that we can also start to really re-envision social relations that give expression to that, that embody that kind of potential, that embody that kind of capacity to actually live ethical lives, to actually take care of each other. Um, you know, in the way that feminism is articulated and so on, right? So, you know, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, big task. So yeah, I, I, I completely, I completely agree, you know, that, that um, environmentalism, what does it say, you know, is failing to elaborate alternative social model. That's the job, right? That's a big part of our job, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, just, just to restate what you've said in, in, in a slightly different way, and, and starting with your point about the left having failed, I mean, one reason it failed, and you know, we see this with, with the history of, of the big socialist states, is that there's the naive notion that you can simply transform by transforming the social structure with the same kind of people. And, and, and I think, in a way, that's been the fatal dichotomy, is somehow... Uh, socialism has understood the problem as simply a structural one 
mm. and uh, you just change the social system and, and everything will be okay. On the other side, you have religion and movements such as feminism, which you mentioned, which is the focus is very much on your own individual transformation or more classically, your own individual salvation. And somehow th those two things have been so separated, the notion of social transformation and personal transformation. And I think one of the important realizations uh, in, in the last century, in, including, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist uh, social engagement as well, is the necessity for both, that they, they reinforce and that they help each other. And somehow the idea that we're going to solve our problem by simply doing one or the other, I think we can see that that just isn't working. And that's why, I mean, that's the sense in which eco-dharma has built within it a certain aspect of spirituality in the sense of understanding the importance. We don't just go out and try to transform the economic or political or social relations without also working on ourselves, which of course is the strength of Buddhism traditionally in terms of the kinds of meditative practices that that it has emphasized. Does that accord? Yeah, 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 it does to, to a large extent. And and I think I think as well, I mean although although I think it's true, you know, this this idea that there isn't there isn't a an adequate kind of social alternative to being being articulated. I still think it's important to recognise the extent to which we are building alternatives. Mm. You know, like you know, the the, the it's um, you know the from the, the ground the, up, yeah. Like the, the seeds of that, right? And kind of right. like you know, experiments and that are going on all around us. Right. Um, and that is part of environmentalism. You know, that is you know the, the way that people are sort of developing re, you know re, relocalization initiatives that people way that. People are, you know, there's, there's just, regenerative agriculture. It's happening, yeah. Or, or kind of, you know, mutual aid support, support networks within communities. The way yeah. that I don't know how it was in the states, but in certain parts of Europe, it's like with a pandemic. The way that people began to notice that there's an older person living in the street who is is socially isolated and needs food taken to them, right? Now, the, these are embodiments of alter, you know, alternative ways of being. I think, of course, scaling that up is difficult. I mean, there's great work being done on that. You know, Tim Jackson, you know, Prosperity Without Growth is an ancient book now. You know, it goes like, I don't know, like 10 years ago or something, right? Mm -hmm. You have fantastic work on kind of modeling uh, alternative kind of economic systems. Um, another really good, good guide, I think, to thinking about how do we do this imaginative work is Eric Olin Wright. Um, Eric Olin Wright, that's with a W at the start of Wright, and uh, his project uh, Envisioning Real Utopias. So it's very, mm. very quick. He died just a few years ago now, very sadly. But Envisioning Real Utopias is a wonderful guide to this idea of like, you know, visioning not just the future, because, you know, utopias are a great idea. What we've also got is like, what's the process of kind of getting there? And recognizing that there doesn't exist, there have to be methods for sort of reinventing ourselves and evolving in, in, in the sort of ever changing circumstances. So he does a really, really good job of that. Yeah. Not separating the means from the ends in this regard, too, because that's been a lot of the problem with socialism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple more questions here. There's a, a follow up to the first question about. Guya Pati emphasizes that the change requires much hard work. Is it possible to turn this hard work into play? No, that would be too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I definitely think that's, that's, that's important, right? That's definitely important to, to kind of emphasize, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's connected with this fundamental Buddhist principle about non-attachment to results. As I emphasize in a lot of my talks now about the new bodhisattva or ecosattva path, you know, our task is to do the best we can, you know, without attachment. That's not to say we aren't as strategic as possible, but in terms of our control and and th there should be there can be something joyful in that. You know, it's not all, uh, you know, plodding away and difficulty, but actually enjoying ourselves. And what else do we want to do with our time on this earth once we realize what's happening and when you know once we realize 
what the potentials are. I mean, as opposed to the kind of addictive qualities of uh, most types of consumerism that are, you know, advertised and were, were conditioned into by uh, neoliberalism and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's a comment here from Karen Myers saying, engage Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia precisely say that the fault of Marxism was not having a sufficient spiritual moral foundation. Uh, she's referring to people like Ambedkar, Buddhadasa, Sulak Sivaraksha, and so forth, with kind of according with what we were saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting the way that the a lot of the social engagement that's going on in South and Southeast Asia is in part a reflection. That's something that I think Buddhism has learned from its interaction with the West. A, a number of people, I think of Sulak and Ambedkar, both studied in Western universities. And there's a certain, certain kind of social justice concern that they brought back into the Buddhist tradition and, and enabling them to uh, sort of develop certain strands within Buddhism that have not been developed in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like those potentials have always been there, but bringing them out, I think, required, seems to have required that kind of external stimulus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, you know, we also are indebted in, in another direction as well, right? Mm. Mm. Well, I think there, I think we have a lot to learn from the whole Western history of social justice, including people like Marx and, and so forth. And uh, it, it's part of that really exciting interaction of all the different traditions. Uh, I mean, as, as we both know well, it, it's not simply about Buddhism and related spiritual traditions coming to the modern world and offering, but it's really an interaction where each grows and learns and develops from that conversation with the other. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any last words before we uh, before we sign up here, sign off here? Uh, mm -hmm. While, while you are thinking, I need to say, I need to say you know, you, at the beginning, you were, you, were, you were saying how appreciative you were of, you know, coming here and some of the inspiration mm. that you gained from that and the work we've done here over the years as well. But, you know, just obviously, you know, when I told the story about how Eco Dharma came about, you know, I didn't mention the, the important influence of your work. I mean, I read, I think I mentioned to you, this to you when you were here and I may be being a bit dismissive of it or saying, oh, that old book or something. But um, your book called um, a, West, a Buddhist History of the West. Yeah, is that the name? Was that the name? A Buddhist History of the West? You Funny know? you say that. That's the one book I don't think anyone's ever read. So it's yeah. happy to hear that, that you did. It's it kind of a collection of essays, I think, actually, right? And there's stuff in there like um, uh, The Religion of the Markets, I think it is, is one of the essays. And a bunch of other things, like really. Dogen and Momo as well, I think might be in there. I'm not sure. Maybe it's not in there actually, that, that particular one. But there's some great stuff on time and so on. And you know, what a fantastic kind of you know collection of sort of ideas and thinking there, the kind of you know, the synthesis of Dharma and you know, really sort of erudite kind of you know reading of some really important thinkers in 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 in, in sort of what you know Western Western tradition as well. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to express the gratitude. That I have for, for that, you know, how inspiring and how informative, you know, how formative uh, some of that work was has been on, on me and the project here too. So, you know, a lot of appreciation for that, baby. Thank, thank you for those kind words. Uh, I appreciate it. And I, I think you know, because I've already said it, just how important your Eco Dharma Center has been. You know, I don't know whether the the kind of possibility that led to the eco dharma center here in colorado whether that would have ever happened without your example and even though there are many things within what you've created that i mean you're you're far ahead of us in terms of your engagement and what you've been doing but uh, it's really uh, it's really inspiring and i i think when i think of the eco dharma movement uh you and joanna macy are the uh, two two founders that I immediately think of. So we're really, really grateful to you for your example. And I should say, you know, we're still hoping, I don't know if and when this will be possible, whether, you know, how we can sort this out, but we'd love to have you come the come and visit the uh, 
Rocky Mountain Ecodharma Retreat Center sometime, perhaps as part of a larger American um, trip, it, if we can ever sort that out. Yeah, I mean, what you're doing is really, you inspired um, us and you continue to inspire us. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for us to meet either, either way. Yeah, yeah. So, Great. yeah, Great. thanks David, really appreciate it. And I enjoyed, enjoyed, enjoyed chatting with you as well. Now, before we sign off, uh, if people want to find out more about the Ecodharma Center in Spain, I believe they can go to your website and sign up for your uh, list there, your email list. Is that? And so that's just simply ecodharmacenter.org and it's center with an R E, British spelling. It's not, it's um, ecodharmacenter.com. Dot com. Got it. Com. Yeah. Got it. And so with the British spelling, that's right. Yeah. Great. So I, I encourage people to do that. And likewise, if people want to sign up for the uh, Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Retreat Center, they can go to our site. Yeah. And the easy way are a www, of course, dot rmerc dot org. I think that one is Oregon and there's there's a way they can sign up and, and get more information there. So I'm hoping that people will want to uh, follow up and find out more. Yeah, great. Yeah, and, there's, and of course, there's also for us the uh, ulexproject.org, ulexproject.org. Project. And the, the center actually, you can do ecodharma.com, I think just gets there too. I think it mirrors actually, yeah. Great, great. Well. What can I say? Keep up the good work, and I hope we'll have other opportunities to uh, talk and and share and uh, get together. Yeah, I definitely hope so, David. Thank you very much. Lovely to hang out with you. Great. All right. To be continued, I hope. Maybe we'll do another one of these. Uh... Yeah, let's. Let's. That'll be fun. All right. Not, not too much hard work. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's play together. Cool. Bye. Bye.